Good evening, everybody. My name is Saj Freiberg. Welcome to Beyond Belief, where we invite you to participate us participate with us um, in exploring the human search for meaning and integrity in the modern world. Um, tonight is a very special show. I am very honored and and uh, excited to uh, have a, a very uh, actually a, a, a friend. And, and, and a very um, amazing guest tonight. Professor Green, Brian Green, is a world renowned, is world renowned for his groundbreaking discoveries in the field of superstring theory, including the co-discovery of mirror symmetry and the discovery of spatial topology change. He is a professor at Columbia University as well as the director of Columbia's Center for Theoretical Physics. Professor Green is also known to the public through his New York Times bestselling books and numerous media appearances, as well as his uh, show, his series uh, uh, on uh, um, uh, the elegant universe. So an amazing uh, uh, guest, and uh, we want to invite everybody to please subscribe to our channel if you would like to be part of future discussions um, about the search for meaning and, and integrity in the modern world. and. Uh, Without further ado, uh, Professor Green, are you there? I am here. Yes, uh, it's great to see you. Here we are. Here we are. So I, I, I wrote down in my introduction um, uh, 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 that I want to bring the audience in on our, uh, our friendship and relationship. We grew up uh, in the same building, and Brian is a longtime family friend. And so we're both uh, uh, Jewish kids from the Upper West Side. Who, who grew up and found our, found our way in life and uh, uh, became reconnected uh, many, many, many years later. And we had arrived at, at, at sort of radically different visions, although maybe not as radical as people might think. I think at least my impression from the book, there, there might be more overlap than we think um, uh, in life. Uh, um, I uh, moved to Israel and I studied for a number of years there and am now a teacher of Torah. Um, and, and Brian obviously became a, a very uh, world-known and world-renowned physicist um, who has just written a book, which is kind of outside. I think, Brian, you would agree. It's sort of a departure from a, from a regular book about physics, but um, is more of a book really about the search for meaning. So these are we're, we're more like uh, old family friends reconnecting and discussing uh, the way we the way we kind of see the world and uh, inviting everybody out there to be part of the discussion and to be able to to, to listen in. Would you would you would you agree with that uh, characterization? All sounds great. The one thing I'd add is that I'm a good deal older than you, and you might <laughs> remind the audience that it was your older brothers and I who would like kind of torture you as a as a young kid it's making true, you do things true. that you know and it's but true yes, it's bringing so. it's bringing back bad memories as yeah, we speak exactly. actually I, i'd forgotten i'd forgotten how much <laughs> abuse i received <laughs> at your hand hopefully it will be different this evening um in fact tonight i'm taking my revenge uh, uh that's this is a big setup perfect, um perfect yes yes um brian was was really close and is still close with my with my older brothers i was the little one uh who was uh uh, running with the rug rat, so to speak, and uh, but now, but now, uh, uh, we're, as percentage of age, we're getting closer and closer. It all evens out in the end. That's uh, the weirdness of time. Yeah. So I wanted to to dive right in, and uh, your book is called um, "Until the End of Time." Your newest book is called "Until the End of Time," and um, it was inspired by. Uh, well, why don't, why don't you, could you introduce what, what, do you, what inspired the book and what is it about? Well, I would say the book in some sense is one that I was slowly writing in my mind without setting anything down to paper for decades. You know, I'm one of those physicists who, yes, is deeply interested in, you know, finding something new, some new quality of the world, some new mathematics that can describe reality with greater precision than the old mathematics. All that is bread and butter for us. But I also have a deep motivation for this, which goes beyond the thrill of discovery, which is just to try to use these ideas to illuminate who we are, where we came from, what the point 
of it all is, and I kind of always had a parallel script going in my mind while I was doing my more traditional physics research and finally decided it was time to set those ideas down. So um, it's, it's, it seems to me fair to say that the, the book is really about your, your search for meaning. Yeah, yeah, I'd say that's a good summary of it and trying to give the perspective of a physicist on issues that we all care about, issues of what role does religion, perhaps that's something we may talk about tonight, have <laughs> in, in, in our world, in the modern world. What's, what's the nature of, of the myths that we tell? Why do we tell stories? Why do we create works of art? when there are other ways to spend our time that at least from an evolutionary perspective, you might think would advance the species more fully than some of the things that we do. So those are the kinds of questions that I think at one level or another, we all care about, we all think about. And the point of the book is to give my specific perspective on these questions as informed by decades of physics research. So, um, uh, I want to, uh, you know, this is, it's selfish of me. I don't know if the audience is going to be as intrigued, but there's a, there's a famous book by um, Rev. Yosef Dov Soloveitchik uh, called the, the Lonely Man of Faith. Have you ever heard of that book? I think you may have mentioned it to me some time ago, but that probably <laughs> is my only introduction to it. Only introduction. Yeah. So, so he says something at the beginning of his book that I wondered how sympathetic you would be to it, right? He, he, writes, he writes the following thing. He says, oh, this is a bad pause, but one second. He says, before I go any further, I wanna make the following reservation. Whatever I'm about to say is to, be seen only as a modest attempt on the part of a man of faith to interpret his spiritual perceptions and emotions in modern theological and philosophical categories. If my, uh, skipping a sentence, if my audience will feel that these interpretations are also relevant to their perceptions and emotions, I shall feel amply rewarded. However, I shall not feel hurt if my thoughts will find no response in the hearts of my listeners. I was gonna ask you, this book, this particular book of yours, how much of it was for you <laughs> and how much of it was for everybody else? Well, that's a good question. And it's a question of, of course, it's relevant to every book that any author writes. Why do okay, you sit down, true. you know? And, okay, and, 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 but, but, but you're right, this particular book raises that question more forcefully because in my previous books there wasn't a whole lot of me as a as an individual as a person it was more me as a professional physicist and, and trying to understand things and explain them to a general audience so here where it really is a more personal quest it is partly for me it was a way of solidifying ideas that I had been thinking about for a long time. But unlike the author you just quoted, I think I would be hurt <laughs> if, if the things I wrote didn't resonate with anybody. You know, if I was really the, the lonely man of science <laughs> as opposed to the lonely man. Right. Because I do feel, I do feel that the that the the insights that science has revealed when phrased in the right language can be widely appreciated and have wide impact. And look, I'm not talking in a void here. I mean, if I just wrote the book in a bubble, then perhaps there would be the danger that it wouldn't resonate with anybody. But I've had conversations with so many people over so many decades, artists and scientists and thinkers of various stripes who do find that when I describe ideas of the Big Bang and ideas of the nature of time and relativity and quantum mechanics and try to connect them to 
a wider worldview beyond just trying to predict things, which is what we physicists are professionally all about, that the ideas do resonate. So I kind of already had a hint that these ways of describing things would not would resonate. Yeah. Right. Right. No. So I'm going to ask the question bluntly. What what conclusion do you feel like you came to? It's an unfair question. It's a, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a coarse question. But you have the prerogative but... to ask it. So absolutely. <laughs> so so obviously, it's hard to summarize complex ideas and and long decade long journey. What are some What are some of the conclusions? Yeah, but, but I would say I I I am happy to boil it down because the main conclusion I reach is not particularly original. It is not a notion that we have not seen in the world's faiths and the world's literature and the world's philosophies across the ages, which is the simple but profound truth that the focus of life needs to be in the here and the now. Now look, mindfulness teachers and sages have said this through the ages. My point though, is that I get to that same conclusion through a very different trajectory. And the trajectory that I follow is to take the reader from the Big Bang through the emergence of stars and planets and people, through the kinds of things that people do when they recognize the predicament that they are in, that they're these self-reflective beings walking around on a nondescript rock that's in orbit around an ordinary star. What do they do? And when they turn their attention to the future, what can they figure out? And what we have figured out is that in the far future, everything we care about more than likely will disintegrate, will go away. And when you recognize the ephemeral nature of everything, for me, it gives basically certain, you're, con you're, you're contemplating death. That's you're contemplating death writ large. We all yes. as individuals With the capital D. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you realize that the universe itself suffers a kind of death, that the universe itself has a kind of inbuilt mortality, much as we do, you recognize that the idea of legacy, the idea of working for the future, not that those can't be valid and vital things to do, but the ultimate value is from the here and the now, because it all ultimately goes away. So, 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 and, and it's, uh, this is a predictable um, debate for us to have, but 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 let's have it, or not debate, but discussion for us to have. Sure. Yeah. To me, right, the 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 affirmation that everything is going to disappear, um, which of course in your book you're not stating as an affirmation; you're stating as 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 a conclusion based on um, all the available evidence that you're able to gather. What difference does the here and now make? Yeah, good. And, and I would turn the question around. If you look through human civilization and human history, there has been an extraordinary focus on the future. There's been an extraordinary focus on permanence. And the reason for that, as far as I can tell, and there's evidence in anthropological records and in philosophical records. I think the reason for that is we are the singular species on the planet that fully recognizes its own mortal nature, right? I mean, other animals may respond to the death of a member of their group, like elephants is a good, provide a good example. But I think that we are the only species that from early on in our life recognizes that we are going to die. And because of that recognition of our own mortality, we cling to things that won't die or the idea of things that won't die. And so it's completely understandable why we have placed such focus on things that are not the here and the now, but the reality, at least as revealed by physics, as we currently understand it, I'm open to things changing in the future. But based on what we know now, the idea of permanence is a human invention. In fact, I think many things we're going to talk about tonight are human inventions. And so the here and the now is the only place where experience resides. And experience, human experience, is the only place that value can reside because we 
are the inventors of the idea of value. We are the originators of the concept of purpose and meaning. And so the only so, place that that can truly reside is here with us. So I don't, I don't want to overstate what, what I want to ask you or, or where I want to take this, but, but if, if we were to translate, right, and, 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 and we're, we're speaking in very rough terms, but this is something that's always, you know, if we were to translate the here and the now, right, but that's what's important right, into moral terms and not worry about the future. That could be an enormously destructive conclusion to reach about the nature of reality. And obviously, I'm coming from a place of saying, right, that, that, that um, as a teacher of Torah and somebody who promulgates Torah, right, the great Jewish ethical tradition, right, I'm interested in, and not, I'm not interested in that because I happen to teach Torah. As a human being, I'm interested in having a basis for morality, um, a philosophical basis for morality. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess I would say two things. First, when I speak of the here and now, I do it with a particular sense of time and sense of scale. So when I say the here and the now, I don't mean literally in this very moment. I look at things from a cosmological perspective, and that's really what the book is laying out, that perspective. And so the here and the now for me is this little tiny window on the route from the beginning to eternity when we humans can exist when cogitating structures such as ourselves can survive. But so Brian, my, my here okay. and now is huge by human scales. Okay, but, but in the end, in the, but, but, but compared to the end, which you describe yeah. in your book, if it's all going away yeah. and it's all going away, one would assume for an infinite amount of time. Yeah. Whether we're talking about this second and I wanna, I wanna steal that guy's car. Yeah. <laughs> or we're talking about, you know, a few million years, billion yeah. years. In, in, in Talmudic speak, we would say, my nafkamino, what difference would it make? In other yeah. words, in the end, if it's all going away, yeah. and there is no God, and there is no um, permanence to anything, and therefore the here and now is precious because it's all we have. So all the more so, I, I, I should... I should, I should, I, moral considerations shouldn't come into play. So, so the reason I talk about the time scales is because I do want to emphasize one side point, then I'll come directly to the question you asked, which is issues, for instance, of, of climate change and responsibility to the planet. That to me fits within the here and the now. So that's the side point that I just want to make clear. But the broader question you ask is, why should we care at all about doing the right thing? You know, why should those kinds of considerations play any role at all? And my view on that is that the whole notion of right and wrong, good and evil, all of these concepts are human conceptions. They do not have any basis in some external truth that's hovering beyond the world that we inhabit. And the way that these ideas become relevant is in the evolutionary progression from the earliest form of our species, say wandering a couple million years ago on this planet to the form that we take today, we have found that we are more powerful if we can live in groups that can cooperate. Collectively, we can do things in a group that we simply could not accomplish as individuals. And we found that group living is facilitated, is enhanced. What we can do is bettered if there are certain codes of conduct but, that we agree to follow. And so but, that to me is all that it is. But Brian, yeah. and again, like, you know, it's like we're in the living room on 25 West 81st. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, 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 wanna, I wanna really ask you about this. Yeah. Uh, because it, it it frightens me. 
it frightens me because 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 um and and the fact that it frightens me doesn't prove anything i'm aware of that i i, I understand that um there are other things that maybe prove things you know what i mean and you can and feel free to reverse this discussion at any point you know and what difference would it make if there was a god would that make a difference if, what's, how would you know what's right and wrong then that's fine i'm i'm, I'm happy to discuss that yep but but you and I live in a time when more and more scientists are wanting to use their expertise and apply it to issues of the human condition, to issues of meaning, to issues of, you know, how life should be conducted. And I, I really don't see, I, I, in other words, what you just said in group, we work in groups, and so it's more convenient. All you've really said there is murder is an uncomfortable way to manage our lives. Not that it's wrong. Yeah, and it depends on what one means by it is wrong. If one means by it is wrong that there is some code of conduct that transcends us, yes, somehow out there, and yes. to transgress against it is your definition of wrong, then yes, I do not see that that holds in the reality that we inhabit, the reality that I understand. But it is the case that if you look at collections of individuals who practice the kinds of behaviors that we typically condone and don't undertake the behaviors that we don't condone, such as murder, those groups are able to prevail, to survive, to navigate their environment in more effective ways. And in fact, from my perspective, it feels more organic and it feels more noble for us to not undertake certain behaviors, not because we fear that there is some overarching power that will somehow take retribution against us in one form or another if we go against the code of conduct that is imposed on us from on high. I think it's more noble for us to invent the codes of conduct and to decide that we are going to follow those codes of conduct because of the way that it facilitates a better world for us to be in, as opposed to us being afraid or fearful or simply blindly following the dictates of ideas that we believe are imposed on us from some higher power. So, so I wanna, I want, I wanna, I just wanna say just from my own, you know, you know, I hate to use the word, but my, my perspective as an observant Jew, you know, this idea that, you know, the, the fear is the major motivator, the, the idea that, there's this outside force that if I violate, it's going to come get me, right? There's, there's, I think, and I think it's important. I think this, maybe this is just, you'll, you'll let me know if you think it's a significant way of saying it, a, a, a different way of framing it. But, but rather, it becomes revealed to me that life is precious with a capital P. And when I relate to life in that way, all sorts of wonderful things occur. And when I don't relate to life that way, all sorts of negative things occur. And there's really no contradiction, you know. But I'm with you completely right there. So, so far, right. I'm like, yeah. Right. But, right. But so, what I'm saying is, is that the yeah. fact that it's God. Yeah. Is not a source of fear for me. Great. Yeah. It's a fill. Well, I'm not saying, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm probably, I'm, I'm scared of God all the time and I'm, thank God I'm scared of God sometimes. <laughs> but, but, but what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that. I'm saying in terms of the philosophical structure yeah. of the way in which I relate to the world I'm in. If I relate to it along the lines of the way you're describing it, right? Yeah. I am nothing but a 
creature trying to figure out the most efficient manner in which I can thrive. And if the most efficient manner was to be to wipe out a whole bunch of other people, yeah, okay, you're right. Most groups, may, maybe my group's different. I don't know. You know, like, you know, I'll try it. Yeah. But if, but if I understand that there is something intrinsic, and this relates to, you know, if, if there is a creator, then there is purpose. If there is purpose, then when we relate to that purpose, we're having good. And we're, if we're not relating to that purpose, we're having bad. But what I, it, it forces me to relate to you not as a meat puppet, but as something yes. more. And that's not out of fear. That's yeah. something that made I discover something in you that I never would have discovered in you if I only related to you as a meat puppet. Yeah. So, so I should say that I am all too happy and totally supportive of any pathway that gets one to the place <laughs> that you describe. I think that's a great place to get to. I feel like I've gotten to the same place just through a different trajectory. And the trajectory that I find most supported by my understanding of the world and also the most gratifying is one that does start by thinking of us as meat puppets. I don't think there's anything wrong with that because that's all that I feel that we are. We're, we're highly organized configurations of particles, the same kind of particles that make up you know, a rock or a cow or anything else in the world. That's all that we are. The beauty of a human being is that those particles are so exquisitely configured that we can do things. We can think and feel and, and look out at the world and try to understand things. And so you call that you call that beautiful. I would say beauty's in the eye of the beholder. You happen that. to have a preference for consciousness. Um, you know, I think that that I mean, I think if we could do away with all the humans on the planet, we'd have a beautiful garden. You know what I mean? We should all commit suicide and leave this planet to thrive without our crazy self-aware neurotic destruction of everything well i mean what you're pointing out is that we so-called thinking creatures don't always think clearly we don't always do the thing that is most fruitful for ourselves in the environment i mean this is an interesting puzzle of why it is that we can behave in manners that can be so incredibly destructive and i think that is a an interesting and, and important pathway to investigate. But to the larger question of, do you need some basis for behaving the right way, some basis that you can point to as somehow not generated by human beings, but coming from some other source? I don't feel that's necessary to get to the place that you were describing where we can relate to each other in ways that it's are not, respectful it's and, and, and it, yeah, it, it's not I'm, not. I'm not saying it's. I'm not. There's a common argument that's made yeah. by many of my colleagues, right? Which is that, um, you know, without, um, without uh, 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 God and 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 religion, yeah. Um, um, you know, humanity would 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 deteriorate into into uh, selfishness. Yeah. Um. I I think that that's true. I do think that that's true, and I think that you you're. I mean, I don't. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but you're demonstrating a lot of faith, right? In 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 suggesting that civilization pivot and base itself on a completely different way. Oh, you no, 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 I got to push back on that. I don't feel that way at all. In fact, I agree with you that a dominant influence and a vital influence on the world at large is coming from religion. Now, religion can push us in both directions, as we have seen. 
So it's not as though it yields some pure pathway yeah. toward, you know, the kinds of right. behaviors that we'd like. But I, I mean, we, have, we, have, we have to get religion right also. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> right. But, but I, am, I am not one of those folks who is at all espousing that somehow we need to get rid of religion and focus on a scientific perspective, because I do not feel that way at all. My view is that it's a deeply personal choice. And it's a deeply personal pathway that takes you toward a truth that feels internally satisfying and gratifying and allows you to be in the world in a manner that you consider to be fruitful and effective. Now, for me personally, I've not needed the religious perspective in the traditional sense. But if you were to ask me, am I spiritual? I would say absolutely yes. Now, some of my colleagues, when they hear me speak like that, they don't like it. They feel as though somehow I'm muddying the scientific worldview by saying that there is something else. But the something else I'm referring to is not stuff or ingredients or, or forces that are out there that somehow are beyond our understanding of the physical world. I'm talking about the inner journey of exploration that to me is just as vital as the external journey to understand protons and neutrons and black holes and, and neutron stars. And it's that inner directed journey, which for many is facilitated by one or other of the world's religions. For other individuals like me, I see it more as a distinct quest that I would call a spiritual quest that doesn't need the specific rituals and writings of one of the world's religions. But I do consider it to be resonant with that kind of perspective you know i i, I don't you know i i actually believe that um and i'm and i'm you know i think that i'm i'm theologically backed up here by some sources but not by others <laughs> that um through the deep serious contemplation of the nature of reality in, in the material world yeah that it would be unsurprising to me if we were to discover that all the, the 10 commandments it, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me yeah that 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 things would converge that way yeah um in fact because, i would say they have i would say they have so but, so okay yeah. may, I, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean, but I want to, I want to stay. I, I want to ask you what you mean, but, but let me just, yeah. let me just, I, I want to pivot because I want to. There's another aspect of things that it, the, the. Well, there's so many different ways we can go. So, but, 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 let's let's just spend a moment and, you know, in in Jewish tradition. Um. I think it would be like a little pedantic for me to read you this thing that I've always wanted to read you, you know, <laughs> but I'll find another time and I'll send it to you, whatever it is. But when, when, um, when we speak about the patriarch Abraham, yeah, he's, he's described in the rabbinic literature in the Torah, it doesn't say much about the origin story, but he's described as a child prodigy that looked at the world and grew up among idolaters and philosophically arrived at the conclusion that there must be a bedrock, a fundamental uh, reality beyond the one that we inhabit that um, is the source of all of existence. Yeah. Of existence. I'm not just saying of people, sure. I'm, I'm, of existence okay. itself. Yeah, sure. Of existence itself. Yeah. Um, very important. The Rambam defines God as if everything in the universe were to cease to exist, God would still exist. Sure. Which means that there's no aspect, you, there's no physical um, particle or anything that, that, that is necessary. Um, it's something completely unknowable yeah. and beyond. Our tradition describes that as something that Avraham discovered. Yeah. And it's, it, it goes to great pains 
to say he had no teacher. He had nobody to talk to about it. He had no tradition. Yeah. He was completely on his own with his mind and specifically examining the physical universe. Yeah. So in other words, Abraham didn't need God. He discovered God. Sure. According to Jewish tradition. Right. When you, I know this is a little bit long, but I'm going to finish up in one second. No, 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 that's good. You, you, you make, you make um, several statements in the book, you know, th that are very categorical. There doesn't need to be any designer. There doesn't need to be any purpose. There is no designer. There is no purpose, right? Why are you so convinced of that? Yeah. So first I should say, I'm not dogmatic. So... I allow for the possibility yes. that, that that's yes. just wrong. So, you know, if, if one day there was some kind of event or evidence that suggested that I was wrong, I would be not only open to it, you should know, I'd be thrilled. You, I you know. And you're, and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're, I think one of the reasons why we're both fun to talk to is that we both share openness to evidence and, and, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, as I look at my my image that you just made bigger on the screen, it looks like I've got like an angel's halo around my head. <laughs> Where's my screen. halo? Oh, yeah, I'm right, supposed exactly. to have the halo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> my poor, my poor attempt at lighting here. But um, but to but to the to the question of of Abraham, I, I guess the thought that occurs to me is this. So I understand how somebody a long time ago, in particular thinking about the nature of the world, the puzzles of existence, the strangeness of being a conscious being in a world that seems to not have any modality that provides you the reason for being. I can well imagine that a thoughtful, intelligent prodigy, as you describe, might come to the conclusion that there is some external bedrock, that there is some other ultimate force beyond the physical. I can fully understand how the chain of thinking could lead to that perspective. But the question I have for you is, doesn't it seem to make more sense to attribute that conclusion to an invention in Abraham's mind as opposed to somehow Abraham had an ability to pierce reality in a way that most of us can't even thousands of years later and to truly discover something that's out there. To me, the explanation that there's a deeply thoughtful, creative, inventive mind and that mind invented God. So, but I mean, I, I'm not, I, I'm not, uh, well versed in this area, but I mean, I, I, I think um, um, Aristotle also came to that conclusion. Like sure, I don't think, have. yeah, right. So in other words, so so I mean, he's yeah. got good company. It's not like no, he totally. just like <laughs> right. So so totally. so and wait, and 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 these are minds, yeah, that are recognized as being, yeah, that pierced, yeah. I mean, Einstein did it. I mean, I I mean, you know, I mean. You know, and and not only that, and not only that, but but you know, he the, the description of what Avraham did after he did this was he was like he looked around at the ridiculous religions that surrounded him, and he smashed them, and he said, if we keep thinking like this, it's going to be terribly destructive for humanity. He had a similar response to religion that many scientists have today and so i i see evidence of 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 a scientific way of of thinking yeah all, all i would say is that that kind of shows to me that abraham was an atheist save for one particular religion uh, okay so that's so that's, so that's that's the joke that, that that dawkins likes to make too right yeah, it's like yeah, he's like we got it all down to one we just got to get you know, rid of the one but you know but but, 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 but more seriously you you are right that many thinkers throughout our history came to a similar conclusion and when you see the whole intellectual history written out fully 
it's not surprising to me that they came to this place. We are these creatures struggling to understand why we're here. And what better solution could there be than to say the reason we're here is because there's another being and that I other being it, is the source. But it, but yeah. it sounds, to, it's, I'm sorry, but it yeah. sounds to me, I'm trying to figure out yeah. the science, uh, the, 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 like, no, I'm not trying to yeah. figure out the science. That's a bad way of putting it. I'm, 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 I'm much too lazy to figure out the science, but, 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 and again, the uh, let, let, let's let's the question that I mentioned to you when we were talking pre-interview, you know, about about Penrose, right? The provocative uh, 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 the fine tuning fish issue, the fine tuning, right? Uh, yeah. um, um, I, 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 one of world respected physicist, right? Discussing the 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 origin of the Big Bang, right? And he comes to he, he, please correct me if I'm wrong, but he comes to the conclusion that the chances that the universe would end up balanced enough to yeah. have us inhabit it is a one followed by more zeros than there are particles in the universe. Yeah. In other words, th there, he, he seems to come to the conclusion there is no possibility that this just happened. That's, that's, that, that's a modern, respected physicist. You, in your book, right? Insist, no, 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 no. It totally happened. I'm, I, I, there's no purpose. There's no fine tuning. Why do you reach that conclusion? I don't know if you can. Yeah. yeah so uh, the summary of my position that you just gave is a l not exactly how I would frame it. Um, the fine Sorry, I apologize. No, no, it's fine. Uh, but I, you're giving me a chance to clarify. So it's all good. <laughs> uh, so, so what Penrose was saying is that in certain ways of looking at physics, you do run into a puzzle, which is according to certain sets of laws, there would have to be, as you described it, an incredible tuning of certain numbers, such as the mass of the electron versus the mass of the proton, the strength of gravity compared to the strength of the electromagnetic force. There are all these numbers that have to be set in just the right way. In fact, I illustrated this in a Nova program by having what we call the universe machine that literally had all these dials. And I was, I don't know, I guess in our language, I was playing God. So there I was fiddling with the dials and saying, this one has to be this way. That one has to be, and there are like 20 dials and they have to be all set in just the right way for the universe as we know it to appear. And if that's, that's true. That's if that's true. Trouble. Yeah. If that's true, yeah. then why isn't that that's like Abraham? You know, he yeah. he yeah, he yeah. looks at the universe and he looks at the way things are and he goes, This is not an accident. Sure. But but I but the point that I'm making is we physicists see this as a deep challenge. Like physics is not done, it's not finished, it's not complete. And one of the big puzzles is to resolve this fine-tuning question. And there are theories that people have put forward that according to certain ways of looking at it, help us in dealing with this fine tuning issue. They raise other possibilities, like maybe we are only one of many universes in a larger landscape of reality, ideas that rub certain physicists the wrong way. And they say, well, that's the solution. I'd rather have the old problem. So, <laughs> so, so there's, there's that sort of thing that goes on. But, but we agree with Penrose we are totally on the same page that this is an issue that we're working to resolve. But and, and if physics was done and, and we still had this issue, the answers okay. that we would come to are, it may have just been that there's some fluke occurrence that gave rise to the world. Yeah, but you wouldn't say that it. about any, you wouldn't no, say I agree. that. No, I agree. Very yeah. unsatisfying. Very so, unsatisfying. So, yeah. My, 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 my point is this: is that let me just let me just add. Oh, no, wait, 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 I just want to. I just want to. I just. This is. I got. I got. I got to make this one point. I, I think. I think yeah. you really appreciate it. Yeah. I think you really appreciate it. It's interesting to me that in 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 talking about this, you said, but physics physics isn't done. And I understand how the God answer would seem to imply we're done we we figured it out you know you the fine tuning is necessary and and therefore that's god and now we don't need to ask any more questions about fine tuning 
Um, I just want, I, yeah, yeah. I just want to be clear as, yeah. as, 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 you know, talking about this other side of things. Yeah. God forbid. Like, like I'm not saying there's a fine tuning problem, but what I am saying is, is that it would seem to me, given that problem, yeah, that any type of dogmatism about the universe definitely coming from random events would be totally inappropriate. Yeah, so I agree on the on the dogmatism front. I believe that one has to have an open mind and allow not just an open mind, not just yeah. an open mind. There's good evidence that 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 the nature of the origin of the universe seems to be designed. Yeah, so that's where we 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 part company. And if if one views that introducing God in any way, shape, or form assists us in this puzzle that we still face, because I would simply look at that as pushing the buck one step further, inventing a new word called G-O-D, and you say that word is our new name for this puzzle. And I'd be like, okay, so you've renamed the puzzle God, but I'm still completely in the same situation that I was before God, perplexed at how certain qualities of the world came to be. So I'm going to continue to work hard at my physical understanding to try to make headway. You see, let me just take a, a, a step further back. There are many other puzzles beyond this one that physics has faced over the last, say, 100, 150 years. We've tried to understand how the force of gravity works. We've tried to understand the nature of molecules and atoms and the particles that make them up. And at any step of the way, when we encountered a puzzle, someone could have come along and said, that's not a puzzle you're going to be able to resolve. It's just God. God's the answer. And now if we accepted that, we could have stopped, but we didn't. And because we didn't, we've been able to push the frontiers of understanding further and further along so that today, for example, we can use a theory called quantum electrodynamics to calculate and thereby predict the magnetic properties of certain fundamental particles, electrons, muons, and so forth. And in the case of electrons, our calculations agree with observations to more than 10 decimal places after the decimal point. Digit by digit by digit, we can calculate things about the external world. And so this gives us confidence that we're not going to give up. We're not going to say that's a deep puzzle beyond our ability. God is the answer. We're going to. Who said anything about forward. giving yeah. up? Yeah. But who said anything about giving up? Why does my? Yeah. Uh, all good, I good, good, all that, so so perhaps what I would I would frame it as I allow for the possibility that there is a God. I allow for the possibility that one day some evidence some event, some happening may be so overwhelmingly convincing that we integrate that perspective into our worldview. I allow for that possibility. I don't, I don't take it deeply to heart, at least not as yet, because I see zero reason to do that. So the puzzle that you raised, I thought was trying to convince me that I should take the idea of God more seriously because of this issue with fine tuning at the big bang and my it's not an is, issue it's not an issue it's a, yeah. it's 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 a discovery of something that's for, let's leave god out of it okay it's, good. It's, yeah. it's, it's a discovery of something that seems designed and there are many other qualities of the world that seem designed too until we were able to find the fundamental laws and the fundamental equations to calculate it from our first principle understanding. And at that point we said, aha, it's not that there was some intelligence that designed it. These equations just have deep implications. These very simple formula that we can literally write down on a t-shirt in the right notation have such a capacity to give insight into patterns in the external world. And those patterns, naturally, we humans, when we see a pattern, we think it was designed because the patterns of, of everyday things in the world, they usually are designed by an intelligence. 
but the patterns of the deep physical universe, we have so far been able to explain those patterns without recourse to any so, external guiding intelligence. So, so, so the patterns saying, can mislead us into thinking that there is an intelligence that must have designed them when it's just math all the way down. Yeah, well, math is interesting. I mean, uh, the fact that mathematics seems to correspond to the physical universe, some might say, is more evidence of a design. But, 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 I think I think what I'm what I'm starting to understand. Yeah, and I think I, I think this is maybe part of the fundamental friction that often exists between um, um, science and God in the modern world. Is that is that somehow the arrival of the idea of a designer would seem to put the brakes on continuing to explore causes. In other words, yeah. once and 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 I'm tr what I'm trying to figure out, right? Yeah. Is 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 that a problem with with my paradigm and other no, or with our no. and with, I should with, say, and it's a good question. I should say there was a time when I thought that willingness to embrace God would put the brakes. And then I spent much more time with colleagues who at first I didn't even know existed, who are so deeply religious, and yet they pursue their science with the passion that you are familiar with from your non-religious colleagues. In fact, there's a friend of mine, I haven't spoken to him in a long time, he's a Nobel laureate. And we were at- You talked about him with Joe Rogan. Oh, did I? Okay, yeah. And- um, yeah. And no, no, so, you can talk about him now too, but I'm just saying, I, 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 I yeah. think this is the same yeah. You know, so, so, you know, it was years ago, I was invited to a retreat with a lot of scientists to talk about science and religion. And I truly thought that we would all be saying exactly the same thing. I thought it was going to be a completely boring meeting. We're all going to say, sure, it could be that there's a God. There's no evidence for a God. We have to allow for that possibility, but let's get back to work and do our science. <laughs> and, and, and it wasn't the case. I was the only person who had that perspective, you know, the, the audience was, you know, the group of participants maybe was carefully selected, but one individual in particular, this Nobel laureate really made an impression on me because his, his faith is so deeply felt and genuine. And he looks at me as someone who's a little bit lost, you know, doing the science, but not recognizing the full the big, picture. the big, the big, the even bigger picture. Even right? bigger picture. <laughs> you know, so, so I found that I find that, and that had a profound impact on me. It didn't, it didn't really change my worldview in, in a way that I can say shifted my own views when it comes to these issues. But um, I do fully recognize the point that you're making, which is by bringing a theological perspective by bringing some divine being into the equation. You don't need to say that you stop. I, I, I full well allow that as a possibility. My point though is from my perspective, it doesn't assuage the angst of the questions that I'm trying to address. And, and so I view myself as an individual whose role is to look at the world try to explain it as deeply as possible with the tools that we have developed, mathematic experiment observation, and to deviate as little as possible from yeah, previous yeah. understanding in an attempt to have a deeper understanding of other aspects of the world. I just, you know. I, 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 yeah, I just want to put a, a pin in this because I think that, I think that um, normally a lot of scientists um, will put aside the, 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 They'll say, oh, yeah, you know, God is great if it helps you. You know, I, I'm interested in this discovery of, of God that Avraham had, right? And I, I'm interested in science seeing itself as filling in the nature of reality, helping us to fill in the nature of reality. and and. And to really, um, I, I, I think that, that there's some sort of fundamental 
issue with the way I think even a lot of religious people, what, what they mean when they say God, that yeah. that is interfering, which it shouldn't. I actually, uh, I, uh, oh, somebody wants me to mention this comment. Cosmologist Bernard Carr, if you don't want God, you'd better have a multiverse. Yeah, so that multiverse is what I was referring to before in terms of one way of dealing with a fine-tuning problem. Right, but it doesn't, that just pushes off the problem because you go, where does the multiverse come from? Like, no. it, it, it's, it's, and it's just- And you can say, where does God come from? But yeah, and then- No, you know, see, fine, okay. You know, yeah. Ah, so, 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 so that's, no, but so you should say that, a person should say that, right? Because, um, um, one of the fundamental things, and I'm, I'm learning about this now in, a, in, a, in, in, in more in a book called Dat Tavuno, it's written by uh, Rav Moshe Chaim Lezato. And, and he's, it's, he, the, the, the unknowability, the complete otherness yeah. of what we mean when we say God um, is so fundamental to the Jewish way of understanding what we're talking about when we're talking about god it's 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 like um it's not it's not like this but let's just the example like the word infinity we say this word and it's a weird sort of thing because right and you talk about stuff like this all the time because it's something that we understand but we can't comprehend <laughs> sure sure so yep. so so when you say where does god come from right god Literally, what we mean when we say God is something which is totally divorced right. from any material property whatsoever, and therefore has no right, no. Uh, and, so, and so it's it's a kind of um, way of defining away the issue, and some scientists will roll their eyes at that approach. Again, I allow for things in the universe that are so beyond the paradigm by which I understand reality that I might not be able to grasp them. I allow for that possibility. I don't just mean that as a kind of strategic move in a, in a conversation. No, no. I, I really I, believe I it. Yeah, you know, I got it. You know, I just want to say, I just want to say yeah. that there are other properties of this thing we call God other than yeah. its unknowability. For instance, it's singularity, yep. right? Which, which, which suggests things about the nature of reality, which may be fundamental to science. Yeah. So, so I just want to say I'm not. I don't think that that. I only mentioned that one aspect because of the question, right? Where, 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 where did God come from? Okay, I'm getting a note from our producer that. Uh, they they seem to I don't know it's only eight fifty seven but uh, <laughs> do you, uh, did, 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 is there anything you wanted to mention? Well, like, you know, the, one thing I would mention, if 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 you allow me another minute or two, yeah, I should allow is, you more than that. Yeah, is um is when I like where does my worldview come from? Like why do I feel the way that I do? Why do I write the things that I write? And I feel that when you see human beings in the full landscape of cosmological and evolutionary history, it gives you a different perspective and one that I think helps understand why certain ideas emerged as we struggle to understand the world, but see those ideas as a product of the predicament as opposed to a true discovery of something that's out there. I mean, when you think about the Big Bang, this hugely energetic event, energy spreads throughout space, space is expanding, the energy is transmuted into particles, the particles fall together under the force of gravity into various clumps, stars and planets. On one planet, at least, some of the clumps start to be able to make copies of themselves, they replicate, they begin to mutate, because those replicants that can do it stably and more quickly dominate the environment. So there's an evolution by natural selection at the level of molecules that allows the molecules to refine into more complex collections, ultimately giving rise to living systems and ultimately giving rise to conscious beings. So when you see that trail and you recognize that all we are are these collections of particles that are somewhat better organized than other collections of particles, endowing us with the capacity to ask the kinds of questions we're talking about here tonight. 
It makes perfect sense that we are going to invent various ideas to try to assuage the urge, the yearning to understand why we are here at all, why we are thinking beings. And, and, and so I don't see any need, and I don't say it's wrong, but I don't see any need to overlay that with something beyond the story that we're telling. I can understand the urge. I can understand the emotional impact. I can understand the value, but I don't see it necessary to truly understand where we came from, how we got to be here, and why it is that we have a certain kind of urge, a certain kind of passion, a certain kind of view of the world. So I, uh, you know, I, I, I understand that theory. And that's yeah. the theory that your book lays out. Yeah. Um, I, I think you'll admit that a lot of the ideas about the origins of religion and 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 the fact that these ideas coincide with these bio, they're very, very speculative. Sure. And they're very, very difficult to 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 so I just but I just want to but I, but the, I want to yeah, the ideas I would say, but you know, obviously not the evolutionary story at the level of the physical mechanisms, but you're right. If you try to give an evolutionary explanation for religion, totally, right. You're getting, yeah, yeah, I agree. So 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 you know Again, I, I I feel at least that it's way overstated the the clarity with which the the fact that God may satisfy a need, you know, I, I that's a whole discussion that we could have because religion can be the source of of, of, of incredible angst and 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 yeah. so so I it's not but I would like to cap it like this. Sure. I think that 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 at, at this point in our journey, right? Like I'm I'm very convinced that we didn't get the chance to talk about everything that god is something that can be discovered rather mm. than created mm. it's a fundamental aspect god is what we mean by god is a fundamental aspect of reality that can be discovered mm. and if it and that's the only really legitimate way of, of of finding it now how it's discovered the way the modalities in which it's discovered i, I i'm not sure your I mean, position, right? I'm just wondering, does it disturb you at all that those who discover it find different discoveries that are mutually incompatible yes. with yes. each other? I mean, because the yes. discoveries yes. that we find in physics, they all work. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. They work, for, they work, for, they work for a while until somebody finds out they don't work. I think no, it's no, the no. same way with but that. But that, that, that's a little misleading. I have to stop you on that one. No, it's really, it builds. Really, I'm not... Yeah. I yeah. agree with you. It builds yeah. on each other. It's, it builds it's, on it. Yeah. Science yeah. works. You and I are complete agreement. Science yeah. works. Sure. I have no, I have no <laughs> questions about, I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to tell you that God works, but, okay. I, 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 but, 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 but anyway, I, I really believe that if we can start discussing, <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a good okay, quote you got me on there. It's a and great quote. It's great. It's great. Mark we're, we're, we're good friends. We're good friends, and everybody's nice here. But look I, at that I, guy's I, hair, man. He's a young guy. <laughs> you got. You still got more than I do. I got to wrap. <laughs> uh, we have to wrap it up. But I got to say yeah. this: I, I I believe that 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 if we could, if scientists and 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 you know, I'm not categorizing myself this way, but deep religious thinkers, if they can, if they can. Um, work on trying on that discover piece where the scientists are, if we can develop what it would mean to discover that and, 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 and understand what, what are we trying to look for when we, when we yeah. say that, if we could better articulate that so that um, these things are part of the same reality, as opposed to uh, a need that we had to create something that is by the way, the definition of idolatry in Judaism. That creating something which you need and worshiping it. That's yeah. that's exactly what Judaism teaches. Abraham destroyed. That's the worst possible thing. To project yeah. your needs on the universe. Assume that that's the universe. You will never get anywhere that way. You will be trapped in your head. Just like a good scientist would say religion does. That's yeah. exactly what Abraham, his whole quest was to destroy the, cre the self-created notions. So, so this is a fundamental era. I, I hope, I hope, I yeah. really hope we can talk again. Uh, no, definitely. Uh, soon. I, and 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 I and, and I know we have to end. But the one final point is saying I deeply value that inner organic 
attempt to understand the world. So it's, you know, I am Jewish, but you know, <laughs> my, my view is that, you know, that needs to be celebrated as opposed to be wiped out. But it has to be discovery. It can't be created. If it's created, it's, 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 it's a, it, yeah. it's a mess. It'll be a mess. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, my brother. Good talking. Great to you. talking to you. Good night, everybody. We hope everybody enjoyed. Please subscribe down below. And thank you so much, Professor Green, for joining us. Thank you. Great talking to you, Sad. Okay, bye. bye.